Another blood red sunset and yet another moon phase and still another hundred miles to my next resting place Driving down the road, eyes on the horizon Within my car I'm all alone But feeling good and feeling strong Knowing that this path I'm on brings me to myself I'm driving Hey now all, I'm Joey C. Welcome back to another episode of Spirit Sherpa. This is the show that helps and encourages you on your journey to unlock your magic mojo. With me, as always, is the spirit doctor, Kelly Sparta. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Joe. How's it going? It's going really well. I'm excited today because we're talking about something that I've actually had an opportunity to partake in a little bit under your tutelage. Yes. And that is energy healing. Yeah. So for those who don't know, what is energy healing sort of in general? So the general concept of energy healing, we talked about what your energy field is in the last episode. So now what I want to talk to you about is energy healing is the process of clearing out, fluffing up, expanding, you know, allowing things to flow more easily, removing blocks, removing, you know, gunk, right? (laughs) If you can't clear your own field, then you go to an energy healer to get your gunk removed. Right. But the thing that a lot of people don't think about, and one of the pieces that I really wanted to talk to you about today is that there are two pieces to energy healing. One is the clearing away of things that are ready to go. And that's permanent, mm-hmm. you know, until you gunk up your field again, right? But, you know, it's it's not going to be those things coming back. However, what I find when people go to energy healers, especially new people into the, the world, is that they are going in thinking with a do me attitude, like you do with the massage therapist, right? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, you fix me. I'm just going to lay on the table and you're going to fix me. Energy healing only works like that for the gunky stuff that you could clear yourself using the techniques I gave you in the last episode. For the real stuff that energy healing is awesome at, you actually have to be an integral part of the process. You have to participate. And what that means is that you have to really go in and look at the issues that are coming up. I'll give you an example. A girlfriend of mine called me up. She had a huge amount of stuff going on in her life. And she had taken in the child of a friend of hers and was fighting through DCFS and, you know, for custody. And there was a whole bunch of stuff going on and, you know, trying to run her own life and take care of her own kids. And, you know, she was training to be a nurse at the time on top of it, you know, as though that wasn't enough. And, she calls me up and she's like, oh my God, I feel like I've got this steel plate on my shoulders. Like the, the my shoulders feel like they're just covered in steel. And I said, well, what's going on? And she told me about all this. And I said, okay. I said, uh, and what do you want me to do about it? And she <laughs> said, well, I want you to take the steel plate off. And I said, well, it sounds like the steel plate's serving a purpose. It's structural stability to allow you to hold up the weight of the world that you're carrying on your shoulders. If I take it off, you're going to get crushed or you're going to put it back on again. It's serving a purpose. And she's like, well, but I just, I just need it off. And I'm like, well, what are you going to put down? Because it, it's not going to stay off unless you put something down. And she's like, well, I can't put anything down. I said, well, then this is not going to work. And she's like, well, just take it off for a few minutes. I'm like, okay, fine. And I pulled it off. She's like, oh my God, that feels so much better. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and we started talking and, you know, five, 10 minutes later, I go, so how's that steel plate doing? She's like, fuck, it's back. <laughs> I'm like, I know it's back. I told you it was going to be back. If you don't put something down, it's going to be there because it's serving a purpose. <laughs> and this is particularly true for things that are manifested by blocks that we have in our system. So if you have a block in your system that is an unworthiness issue, you know, I'm not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. I'm sorry. I'm doing a Wayne's World moment. Um, But if you have a worthiness issue, then you're going to have a hard time receiving anything. And you could ask an energy healer to go in and clear that worthiness issue for you. And they would do it. And you'd be like, oh, that's awesome. And for a couple of days, it would probably stick because it's not as intense and present as my friend's issue was, right? right? 
But, you know, a week from now, it's going to be back. And you can go to that energy healer 50,000 times and have that block removed, and it will be back in a week. (laughs) Now, that goes to what you were saying then about the blocks that are ready to move. You said that, and I thought that was interesting. You know, things that are ready to go. Yeah. Sometimes things are not ready to go, right? Right. Well, if you haven't done the work. Right. Then you can't, they're not going to go away forever. Yeah. You know, if you have a particularly talented healer, they might be able to pull it out because you've asked them to. They might not. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> but it's not going to last. Yeah. Because you're putting it there because you have a belief structure that supports that it needs to be there. And so it's not going to last. Until you change that belief Until structure. Until you change your belief structure and you do the inner work associated with that. You know, people go into energy healing expecting miracles. Yep. You know, it's, oh, do me, right? Mm-hmm. But the best energy healing is not a do me process. It's a, it's a shared process of moving through things mm-hmm. and allowing yourself to evolve. So what are kinds of things that would be examples of energy healing? Well, the most common one that everybody knows about is Reiki. Yep. Reiki is, is it's been around for a long time. Uh, you know, came out of the 30s, mm-hmm. um, but it's been well known in the U.S. for many, many, many years. I got my Reiki certification in 98. So, you know, that's yeah. a long time ago. And it was around for a long time before that. It was well established when I got mine. And so, uh, you know, the, the benefit of it is that most people understand what it is. They have a concept for it. There have been studies done in hospitals to prove that uh, patients who receive Reiki before going into surgery actually have better uh, recovery times and less chances of infection and all sorts of other stuff. Um, You know, nurses could get CEs in it even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Reiki is awesome as the sort of the foundational understanding of energy healing. And it's become much more mainstream now than it totally. had been even five years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. And and the, the scientific studies have helped that. Yeah. I refer to Reiki as as training wheels for energy users. Okay. Uh, because it's it's a good structural foundation, mm-hmm. right? The average Reiki class is is a reasonable structural foundation for understanding how to work with energy and how to be a healer in a healthy fashion. Mm-hmm. And so I I generally recommend that people start with Reiki. Now, there's any number of other types of healing, you know, Barbara Brennan healing hands and there's um, Louise Hayes, you can heal your life. And there's sound healing and sacred geometry healing. And, you know, you name it, there's a million different types of healing out there that, that you might find as you develop further along in your process, you tend to develop your own way of doing things. There's shamanic healing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's what I do. I do specifically transformation based shamanic healing which is the personal work as well as the energy work exactly i don't do a lot of physical based healing although i do some of that i am certified in shiatsu and i've studied chinese medicine and you know the whole nine yards there so i I do sort of a melange of stuff (laughs) which anybody who's been doing this stuff for 20 years is going to do a melange because we all study a whole bunch of random stuff and then we just bring it together in our own unique fashion. Yeah. But there's lots and lots of healing possibilities out there. And, you know, Reiki is probably the most prevalent and the most easily accessible and probably the cheapest yeah. to get trained on. So why are there so many different kinds? I mean, how do, how do they offshoot so much? Well, so each kind does its own thing. Like I said, I do shamanic transformational healing. Mm-hmm. I don't know any other healing type that specifically does that. Okay. Right? Reiki is a very specific flavor of energy. Mm-hmm. And and the flavor is really the best way to look at it is you got 31 flavors, you know, right? <laughs> yep. Um, but every flavor has its own use. So sound healing could break something up that Reiki may not be able to touch and vice versa. And if you're going into different aspects, then using different things, like we're going to do a podcast later on crystals. Yep. Well, if you use crystals in your healing practice, especially if you're sounding through them or you're running energy through them, then you can amplify the healing process and it brings the crystalline energy into the process and the sympathetic magic, which we'll talk about in another episode as well, of the crystals themselves. So see me Look promoting at you. those future Look at episodes. You. <laughs> see, it helps when I actually have it laid out. <laughs> 
but there are different types of healings for different purposes. Okay. You know, I remember standing in line at an event and a friend of mine had just come out of a breathwork workshop and breathwork is another way to do clearing as well. And it's a internal way to break through your blocks. Well, mm. she broke through her blocks. All right. And she shredded her aura in the process. Ooh. And so she walked up to me and I didn't even know where she'd been, but she walked up. I was like, Oh my God, what happened to you? She was just like, fix it. <laughs> That's all she said. <laughs> you know, when the woman you know who is the most grounded person you've ever met is not in her body, you know you have a problem, right? <laughs> and so, you know, she's just like, fix it. And so I handed my my cup and my bowl to the person behind me because we were in line for food. And and I spent, you know, two or three minutes just you know shoving her back in her body, fixing the rents in her aura, putting everything back together again, getting her situated in her in her chakras properly and really restructuring her field and getting everything just put back together. Right. And, you know, three minutes later, I'm like, better. She's like, oh, yes, thank you. And she wanders off. I turned around and retrieved my bowl and my cup from the woman behind me. And she says, that wasn't Reiki, was it? <laughs> <laughs> and and I looked at her and I was like, and I had to actually think, think through every single step I took to figure out whether or not I had used Reiki in any of it, because I tend to be a mix and matcher. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, yeah, none of that was Reiki. And she's like, what is that? And I had this moment, you know, when I was new, I would ask questions like that of people who were where I was at the time and and they would give me very unsatisfying answers and I I had this moment of looking at her and saying well if you came and studied with me for five years I could give you the context to understand what I did and then we could have the conversation and I could tell you what it was and that sounded so freaking egotistical that I just said eh it's just what I do <laughs> you know? and i went oh that's why they said that to me <laughs> because she didn't have the context to understand she didn't the, the what i would explain the foundational understanding to exactly. even have the conversation exactly yeah. and she didn't have the vocabulary she didn't have the context she didn't have the foundation she didn't and i was just like yeah i just i yeah i can't so the the reason that there's so many different types of energy healing out there is because they may touch on different aspects and it, it's sort of like the same reason there's so many different types of medical specialists out there is because exactly. they have, uh, you know, they, they fit and work with different elements of what you're doing and you have to, as you get more advanced and more knowledgeable, you know, when to use what piece to fix the thing that's broken. Exactly. Oh. And, you know, this, the premises, the, the concepts, the concepts themselves are similar, mm -hmm. right? And they go across all of the things. It's just the, the energies that you're working with are different. For instance, I don't do a lot of physical healing. I just mm -hmm. said that, right? Remember a couple of episodes ago, I said I referred somebody out. Mm -hmm. The person I referred out was looking for help with a friend who had cancer. I don't do that level of physical healing. Do I understand the concept? Yeah, I do. Could I do the energetic process of, of doing it? Yeah, I could do it. Am I the best person to do it? No, I don't do it regularly. I right. don't know the different things I'm looking for. I haven't done it enough to to really have an understanding of the pieces and parts that I would be looking for to be able to do it effectively every time, mm -hmm. right? You know, would, would what I do help? Sure, it would probably reduce the amount of cancer cells in the system and give the white blood cells a, a fighting chance and whatnot, but it wouldn't clear it probably right. because I didn't have the context to do the whole thing. And again, we've, we've talked about energy and magic being intention. What you do and how you approach it makes all the difference as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason I have a concept of how to do that work is because I listened to a podcast that the mad Russian did on marketing of all things years ago <laughs> and in the conversation that he did he actually talked about clearing cancer in the process that he used to do it and i was like oh so i i get the process but i referred her to him yeah because he's the guy who does it and mad russian's a guy up here in boston that's mm -hmm. actually known for smoking cessation but actually does cancer as well so a lot of it's about the approach and how you approach it and having a creative mind is really helpful for when you get into spaces where what you normally do doesn't work. 
because then you can think about it from another perspective. It's like, oh, is this existing on another dimension? Mm -hmm. This block here, I can get it to fold up and go away, but it's still, it, it keeps coming back. How, where is it coming back from after I've removed it? It can't possibly be coming back. Ah, uh, well, it's multidimensional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me, let me spread myself across multiple dimensions and then I'll go and pull that be able in, to find in, the in those different places and I'll get the whole thing. Right. But in, if you don't think in those terms, you'll never be able to clear that block. Well, and that's right? that, that, and if you can't spread yourself across multiple dimensions, you can't clear that yeah. block. Right. So, but that yeah. goes to the fact that there's a difference between, and this is, this is, you know, types of learning right there are people who need to be told exactly what to do in what order and then there are people who want to understand the theory of something so that they can then better suit themselves to situations right. and it seems like where in a reiki class you would teach the people how to use reiki how to actually engage in the act of performing reiki which is pretty formulaic right right but you still need to know the theory behind what it does so that you can appropriately use it where it fits and right. not just for everything. Right. Which you may or may not get depending upon the Reiki class you take. Right. Just just to be really honest with yeah. people, Reiki, because Reiki has been an oral tradition mm -hmm. and there haven't been books and whatnot and because teachers are not regulated in any fashion right. there's a gamut of stuff that you get from your reiki classes but you know the basics are generally there yep. right so you know when i teach uh reiki or anything else i'm a big fan of teaching the theory right because i in fact i really try and avoid as much as humanly possible giving the structure okay because I feel like especially new students tend to lean on the structure so much that they get rigid in their being uh, in the process. And so I really, if you if you remember the Reiki class of mine that you yes. took, classes, yeah. you'll remember that I, I was like, yeah, there's some hand, hand positions here. But, you know, go with what you feel is right, right. you know, because, because it's more important to rely on your intuition and your gut yeah. than it is on the standard hand positions from my perspective. Because yeah. when you want to go to deeper levels of understanding in your healing practice, those are the things that you're going to rely on. And there's not going to be be a set structure in all instances because not everything has been dealt with right and certainly not everything has been dealt with by the person who happens to be teaching you the practice right which is why i'm i'm always such a fan of how do you develop your intuition how do you develop your understanding of the theory yeah i want to teach you how to think about healing not follow these steps and do it exactly the way i do right because people get lost in the magic words of this the the spell or right. whatever they're doing to create the magic and they don't focus on as you continue to tell us over and over again intention and focus right those are really what you need to get on and then and then your intuition ties into that and that's exactly the, you really yeah. get to it people get stuck in the do it right thing too right exactly. you know it's like i've got to i do didn't it right. do it right yeah yeah i've got to do it right did i follow these did i help my hands exactly the right way did i move my fingers in exactly the right way did did i do the the hand positions in the right order it's like oh my god it does not matter yeah it does not matter yeah all it matters is that you go where you feel called to go and you do what you feel called to do and you get out of the way right. of the work, yeah. right? That's all that matters. <laughs> so you had mentioned earlier that energy healing in general is largely a, I want to call it sort of a cooperative effort in the sense of not only does the energy healer have to do the work, but it's not a do me, as you mentioned, right. type approach. The participant also needs to be active and participant, I think, is even a, a good choice of words there. They need to participate yeah. in their own energy healing. What should we do as participants to prepare ourselves when we go to an energy healing? So I think that that largely depends on the healer you're going to. Okay. The first thing that I think that you need to recognize is that energy healers come in all shapes and sizes and in all levels of development. Mm hmm and there is an archetype known as the wounded healer that you need to be really aware of. Because one of the things that they'll tell you about Reiki is that Reiki can do no harm. And okay. so you're totally safe when you go to Reiki treatment. But that's not true. Okay. Reiki itself, the energetic of Reiki, is not able to be used to do harm. However, there's no guarantee 
that everything that person does is going to be Reiki. Just like that woman looking at me saying, none of that was Reiki, was it? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's like, no, it wasn't. So you don't know whether or not that healer is giving you Reiki only or Reiki and something else. And they may not even be aware that they're giving you something in addition to the Reiki. And the wounded healer archetype is, I'm going to fix you to make me feel better. Right. Right? And... When you go into somebody who's coming from that position, they'll say things to you like, I'm going to fix all of your blocks. I'm going to clear all of your blocks. If somebody says that to you, get up and leave. Because that's not about you. That's about them. That's about their ego saying, I'm going to clear all of your blocks. Some of your blocks are there for a reason. The steel plate on the shoulders was there for a reason. There was a woman who came in years ago to my my store and had a block in her throat chakra, which I did not remove because I told her, I said, I'm not going to remove this because I could feel into her energy field and know that she was getting ready to get divorced and that she wasn't ready yet. I said, because if I remove this, you're going to ask for a divorce right now. She's like, oh, no, I'm not ready for that. I said, I know. That's why I'm not going to remove this block. (laughs) And so, but I'm, I'm going to put a zip tie on it for you a zip, so that you can just pull it and it'll be ready to go. And she's like, okay, good. So some locks are there for a reason. They're there to serve a purpose in our lives. And if you remove all of those blocks, because your ego is in it to remove all of them, you are not necessarily serving your client. And in fact, you can sometimes do damage because sometimes we're attached to those blocks, right? We've got all kinds of tentacles into them from, from different angles going, holding on for dear life to that block because I don't want to see that I'm powerful, right? I have to have the, I'm, I'm afraid of my power block because they can't be powerful. So if we rip those out, we can do damage. And so if somebody says that to you, that's not about you, that's about them. And you really shouldn't be getting a healing session from them. So just be very careful with that. Um, and trust your gut, trust your gut, because your gut is going to tell you whether or not this is the right person for you. And if you walk in and go, Oh, I don't know, I'm going to give you this, say, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm having some intestinal distress. I think this is a bad day to do this. Can we reschedule? (laughs) That is what you say. Okay. Because that'll get you out of it. And that is something nobody can argue. No, (laughs) no. Okay. But you, you really do need to just get out of the room if that person is doing that. Um, if, if you walk in and there's something about the space that strikes you as being off or something about the person that doesn't hit you right, you know, really trust your gut on that because you never know what, what you're getting. And if you don't know enough about energy work, then you don't know. Right. Your body knows though. So trust your body. Okay. Well, this is a great transition then, uh, to go into the ask Kelly section where we've got a question that says, how do I choose a good energy healer? You just gave us a lot of things that to look out for, but how can I choose a good energy healer? One of the best ways to find a good energy healer is to ask people who go to energy healing regularly. <laughs> okay. okay. Referral is your, really your best bet, especially if you're brand new and you don't know how to evaluate people based on their energies. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, people like me, I'm very picky about who I'll let work on me yep. <laughs> because... I'm very picky. (laughs) I got a lot of stuff going on and I'm not going to hand it over to just anybody. And so um, not everybody can even see what it is that I'm working on because I've been doing this work for so long. So there are people who are doing energy work regularly. So if you get into the, the personal growth community, if you get into the new age community, the magical community, the, you know, the woo woo, right. Mm -hmm. And you ask people, who do you like? You're going to hear one name over and over and over again. Right. And that's the person you should go to. Okay. That's that's usually your safest bet as a newbie. Okay. So we've talked a lot about energy healing, about healers, about the different types of energy healing out there. What type of training could people do in order to sort of get involved to be an energy healer themselves? Again, I'm going to go back to Reiki. <laughs> okay. You know, today I'm not going to talk about anything on my website. I'm going to talk about Reiki because there are Reiki master teachers in pretty much anywhere in the country and almost everywhere around the world. So, you know, if you want to get a beginning training in how to be an energy healer, Reiki training is a great way to get started. Uh, What I would say is really interview your Reiki master teacher 
and find out if they're teaching about how to set up a container, set a circle or a safe space or a sacred space. These are the words that you'll use to see if they have something where they're teaching that. Because the the one complaint that I have about Reiki is that it tends to be taught in a vacuum of the energetic world. Hmm. And so it tends to be taught outside of a context for that. And I really would recommend that you learn from someone who teaches you how to set a good container and not all Reiki teachers do that. So really interview and find out what they're going to teach you. Uh, the basic Usui method of Reiki is fully sufficient. You know, I teach angelic Reiki and there's any, oh my God, there's so many different channeled forms of Reiki that people have channeled through the years. Um, and, you know, just be aware that that's the case. I have developed a specialty in doing Reiki attunements for specifically for magic users, because one of the things they don't tell you is that when they do a Reiki attunement for you, they bind the symbols into your hands, which if you're sending out energy out through your hands, sends it out through the Reiki symbols, which sort of twists what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I've developed a different format for that. And, you know, if you really want that and you're not near me in Richmond, contact me and, and have your Reiki master teacher contact me if they're willing to modify the, the attunement for you and I can walk them through how to do that. But uh, unless you have a problem with it, you're probably fine with the standard attunement. Right. So, but yeah, go and talk to a Reiki master teacher and interview them and get a feel for them just the way you would with an energy healer. And uh, if they feel good to you, take a class from them. Yep. And you can find Reiki classes wherever you are in yeah. the world. All right. That's all we have then for this week, folks. Be sure to join us next time as Kelly adds another chapter into your beginner's guide to energy, magic, and the spirit world. I'm Joey C. here with Kelly Sparta, and you have been listening to Spirit Sherpa. Each mile so I travel over 13,000 now, so I leave behind a little fear. Spirit Trippa is the sole property of Kelly Sparta Enterprises and is distributed under Creative Commons BY-NC-ND 4.0 license. For more information about this licensing, please go to creativecommons.org. Any request for deviations to this licensing should be sent to K-E-L-L-E at K-E-L-L-E-S-P-A-R-T-A dot com. That's Kelly at KellySparta.com. To sign up or to get more information on the programs, offerings, and services referenced in this episode, please go to KellySparta.com. This episode of Spirit Trippa has been produced by Honu Voice Productions. Home and my love and my life and me.